You know the feeling when your computer or media server locks up and you have no way to fix it without dragging out a monitor or keyboard from across the room. For a long time, the solution has been a KVM over IP device, which was typically really expensive, at least until now. This tiny box from GL.INET promises to solve that exact problem for less than $100. But does it live up to its claims? In this video, we're going to find out. And I'll walk through the entire setup process. We'll test it in real-world application so you can see exactly where it shines and where it falls short. Stick around to see if this budget KVM is the one that you've been waiting for. And if you find this review helpful, a quick like and subscribe is always appreciated. Now let's get it unboxed. Full disclosure, while GL.INET provided the Comet and ATX adapter for this review, this video is not sponsored. All the thoughts and opinions are my own, and GL.INET had no input on this video before it was published. Historically, I've stayed away from remote KVM switches, mainly due to their high cost. However, the market has recently shifted with the arrival of two new affordable devices, the Jet KVM, which I'll review in a future video, and the new GL.INET Comet, with its optional ATX power control board. Given the consistently positive experiences with GL.INET products, I was particularly excited to see how this one performs. In this video, we'll walk through the setup, the features, and put it to the test to see how it all works. In the box, you get a Get Started booklet, RJ45 Ethernet flat cable, USB-C to USB-C cable, USB-C to USB-A cable, an HDMI cable, and of course the device itself. Though not required to use the Comet, if you bought the optional KVM ATX add-on board to control power to your server or PC, you get two different mounting brackets, the standard and the low profile. You get the ATX board itself, a USB-C to USB-A cable, and a plug-in extender cable which will go to your motherboard, and in turn the second connector will be used to route the wires from your current PC or server for power, reset, and LEDs. Taking a quick look at the device, on the front side you get the USB 2.0 port, which is the port that you'll use if you're interfacing the ATX board, an HDMI, which will go to the remote PC, and a USB-C port, which is actually your keyboard and mouse simulator, which will also connect to your server or PC that you're attaching to. We'll see more on this a little bit later in the video. On one end you have a multifunction reset switch, and on the other end you have a 5 volt USB-C input power for the device and an RJ45 Ethernet jack that'll be plugged into your network switch. This version doesn't support PoE, however I bought a $14 5 volt PoE splitter that allowed me to provide 5 volt power to the device as well as data via PoE. If you get a different brand than the one I'm using here, make sure it supplies a fixed voltage of 5 volts with a minimum rating of 2 or more amps. Powering through PoE is a little handy when you need to power cycle the device for any reason, as that's supported with many modern day PoE switches. I'll leave a link to this adapter in the video description. So now that we've seen what's in the box, let's go ahead and hook this thing up. I'll be using my Miele Mini PC for this video to make it easier to actually show on the video. The hookup is pretty straightforward. Using the HDMI cable, plug it in from the HDMI port of the Comet to the HDMI port of your computer. Next, take the USB-C to USB-A cable and hook that up between the USB-C port of the Comet and the USB-A port of your computer, just as you would as if you were doing a keyboard and mouse. Hook up a USB 5V power source from a USB brick, and lastly attach your network cable from your switch to the Comet. As I mentioned earlier, alternatively, you can use a PoE splitter and attach the power and network cables from one cable and supply it from a PoE switch. Now that we've hooked this up, let's power it up and log into the device to start the configuration. GL.INET does supply an app for this device, however, it's not necessary on newer firmware versions as you can log directly into the web interface. If you're going to use the web interface, type glkvm.local or if you prefer, you can use the IP address from your device that you got from your router. If for any reason you don't get the web interface, download the app as you may have an early version of the firmware. 
Once you type the IP or local name, it'll launch you into the main screen where you'll be asked to create an admin password before you can log in, which is a great security choice. Once you're in the main interface, you should see the video output from the computer that you've attached to it. The very first thing I usually do is check for a new firmware version, which is done by clicking on the top toolbar. As this is a new device, they have been releasing frequent updates, so make sure you check for the latest. Now that I've finished the updates, let's log back into the device and go over the settings and features. Looking at the toolbar, we can see the settings button. Under the settings, we can change the video quality from low to ultra high. The default is medium, which I found works pretty well for most applications. Next, you have the orientation in the event that you need to change it based on your own setup. Then you have the option to change the EDID of your monitor, which allows you to emulate a refresh rate and a resolution. You may need to try a few of these to see which one works best for you. I didn't have any issues with the default. Below are the settings for the remote itself. You can enable disable audio, keyboard, and optionally show a virtual keyboard, which is a Nice feature to have in the event that you're working on a tablet or similar device. Under the mouse settings, you can disable mouse control, show local cursor, enable mouse jiggle, set the scroll rate, as well as setting the scroll direction and the mouse mode. Under systems, you can set the language, uh, dark mode, and the option to reset the KVM completely. Clicking on the toolbox, you have a virtual clipboard, which allows you to paste something into the KVM and in turn, paste it into the remote device. This can come in handy when pasting in scripts or text into the remote device without having to retype it again. Below that are some shortcut keys, and below that you can connect a wake on LAN function to another device. Lastly, if you have a direct access to the terminal window, should you need it. Under accessories is where you'll see if you've attached the ATX board. If you're using the board, you'll see the accessory buttons for powering up your device, uh, with a short press, forcing it to shut down with a long press, or pressing restart to re reboot your computer. These functions are only available if you're using the ATX board. Under virtual media, you have the option to drag and drop files into the KVM itself. There's very limited storage of about 5.7 gigabytes, but it's nice to have some space for maybe some small ISO files, some scripts, or something that you need to have on the device. Just bear in mind that copying to and from the device is painfully slow. Under the App Center, there's currently only one listed, and that's TailScale. I did test out TailScale, and it worked great. Being a big TailScale fan, I prefer to use that than any other built-in solutions, so it's a nice touch to see that they've added this in by default. Moving over to the right toolbar, we can see the option to collapse the toolbar, as well as going full screen, which is a better viewing experience and allows you to take advantage of the resolution of the monitor. Next to that we have the check updates button which will tell you if a version is up to date and the long side of that is the version you're currently on. Next you have the button to access the cloud services which allows you to download an app and install their own cloud service to access the device. Again being a Tailscale fan I prefer to use that. Next you have your security settings where you can reset the admin password and enable two-factor authentication. To the right of that is the reboot and logout buttons. At around $90 for the Comet and $102 for the Comet plus the ATX board, this is a full-featured remote KVM and is a great deal. While it costs a little bit more than the Jet KVM, I found the Comet to be a little bit more responsive and the option to add an ATX card for those who want an internal card to control the power and reset is a great option. As I've mentioned in other videos, I personally prefer using a dedicated Tailscale subnet router to access all of my devices rather than managing separate connections. But still, having it as a built-in option is a great feature. If you're like me and you want PoE, just add a $15 adapter and you get that feature. During my weeks of testing, it worked flawlessly and I didn't have any issues with dropouts, disconnects, lockups, or any kind of strange behaviors. It worked first time every time. Let me know in the comments if you're planning to get a remote management device and if you have any questions on this device. That's about it for today's video and if you found this useful, please don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next video.